Good morning. good morning. It's good to see each of you here this morning uh, to join in worshiping our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we come to this hour of worship, we have just a 
few announcements. The first and most important is announcements can be found in your bulletin. So if you're ever wondering what's going on at this chapel, you can find out in the bulletin. Uh, the other announcement, and this is an important one, is Chaplain Fakeney is back with us. He's recovered. Now, he is not 100%, but um, I thought his sermon was 100% last service, so hopefully he's got enough juice left over for this service. And um, he also has family visiting, and we understand other people have family visiting. And we may have other visitors who haven't been with us for a while or are new to our service. And if you're here visiting, we welcome you, even if you're coming from that strange foreign land, Canada, um, or the People's Republic of Maryland, we welcome you all in Jesus' name. Now, our call to worship comes from the Psalms. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us pray. Almighty God, we bow our hearts and minds to you this morning. You alone are worthy of praise and worship. We humbly seek your presence among us. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit and guide us. Guide all that we say, all that we think, and all that we do, that we might bring glory and honor to you. Through Jesus Christ, amen. I'd ask at this time, if you're able, to please stand and join in singing hymn 22, and then remain standing for hymn number 128. Him, him 22, praise the name of Jesus. Dear Lord, we praise you. We praise and adore you as the King of heaven. And we are in awe of your power. And we are filled with gratitude for the love and the care that you show us each and every day. We know that we receive countless blessings that we do not deserve, cannot earn, and could never repay. So we simply say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your wonderful gifts of creation and for our redemption. Receive our prayers, our adoration, our worship, now and always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn number 128, I Sing the Mighty Power of God.
before you return to your seats, I'd ask that you turn where you are and greet each other in the peace of Jesus Christ. I shared with the uh, earlier service that years ago I was a pastor in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and we, we had the passing of the peace. We called it greeting time, but one of our elders really didn't like it, and he called it circus time. And he said it, it, it tends to have a way of getting away from you. Uh, but you know, it's because we're here together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we share a love for each other, and we're happy to see each other we want to greet each other, and we want to share fellowship, and we want to share the peace that only Jesus Christ can give. And now, together, we share a confession that only we have as believers in Jesus Christ, a confession that dates back 2,000 years. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me as we go to God in silent prayer, confessing our sins to the Lord. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, and they are too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change and open us to a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And we know that the scripture promises us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'd ask at this time the ushers would come forward for the morning collection. And as we prepare our tithes and offerings, I'd like to lead us in a prayer and ask God to bless these gifts. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to show our love and support of your kingdom and show our love for you and our gratitude by giving back just a portion of the blessings which you've poured upon us. 
And we pray, Lord, that these gifts would be used here at Fort Belvoir and beyond to call many lost sheep to Christ. And Father, we thank you that we're in this unique military setting where people come and they go, and people come from all over the world, and they go all over the world. And so our ministry has potential that is beyond what we can imagine. We just pray that you'd bless these funds and that you would use them to reach the potential that only you know. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Ask now that if you're able, you'll rise for the doxology. Let us listen and learn from today's scriptures. The first scripture is Psalm 16, and it's found on page 453 in the Pew Bible, if you would like to follow along. You will not abandon my soul. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, 
They are excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows for the, of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take the names from my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, and you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to show or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there are fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures furthermore. Our second scripture is Galatians 5, 1, 13 through 25, and it's found on page 974 in the Pew Bible. Christ has set us free. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serves one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and divide one another, devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Keep step with the Spirit. But I say, walk with the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those do, who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the, bless, the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Amen and amen. Good morning, church. I want to open our intercessory prayer time with a little bit of perspective. Ready? We're almost there. And when we meet here again next week, we'll be there. There is the end of the year. Where has the time gone? This first half of this year has been marked with both remarkable and unexpected events that have and continue to challenge our leaders across the spectrum of leadership. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and for all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Let us pray. Lord God, we live in a badly divided nation from top to bottom, 
where our citizens and leaders argue over issues that must make your heart ache. Lord, we desperately need your peace, and we desperately need your strength and wisdom to stand righteously for justice and also be your instruments for your healing in our world. Lord, let your invisible hand rule in the affairs of our nation and among our leaders in such a way that they will end up ruling in the fear of the Lord, serving your eternal and predetermined purpose for our nation. In Jesus' name. Lord, we pray specifically for the leaders of our nation. We ask that you help them make wise and wholesome decisions that will move the economic, social, religious, and political life of this nation forward. In Jesus' name. We pray for the President, our Congress, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, the justices on our Supreme Court, state governors, and every elected or appointed leader in a position of authority in this country. Lord, call them to lead with your wisdom and insight. Equip them with discerning hearts for our citizens and for our nation's role in the world. Surround them with helpful advisors, sharpen their decision-making skills, and protect them from danger. And Lord, we also pray for their families who are also continually scrutinized and bear an extra load in the public eye. Prince of Peace, come and walk through the streets of our cities. Bring comfort to the hurting, calm to the angry, and your conviction to those who are bent on destruction. Awaken us, your church. Give us courage and kindness in order to be peacemakers that you designed us to be. Help us to demonstrate justice for all people and the unity of a people who is one in you because you created us equally. We long for your peace to come to our nation. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, and now we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Ask now again if you're able to please stand and join in singing uh, our declaration of thanks for God's grace. It's hymn number 642, and we will sing the first, third, fourth, and fifth stanzas. One, three, four, five. <laughs>
brothers and sisters, it is uh, good to be with you, uh, the church family. It is good to have family worshiping uh, with us uh, this morning. And a uh, special welcome to all those who are visiting with us. I appreciate uh, your prayers, and uh, I confess my, uh, my utter dependence on, on the grace uh, of the Lord. And he gives me cause to do so more and more frequently. So uh, how am I? The answer is, well, you're familiar with the... Uh, the magician's act, the classic act where the magician saws the assistant in half. Unfortunately, the, uh, the act goes horribly wrong. So that is kind of how I'm feeling at the moment. <laughs> but the Lord is good. And it is just good to, uh, to be with you uh, this morning. And so we are in the Gospel of John. And uh, we are, have been moving through the Gospel of John for some time. And we are in chapter 6. And this morning we're going to look at verses 16 through uh, 21, but before I, I get to our text this morning, just a, a little uh, review of, uh, of the week prior of where we were with chapter 6. Jesus had fed the 5,000, 5,000 men plus their families. They had uh, become very attracted to the powerful message of Christ. Here he is, the fulfillment, he tells us at the end of chapter 5, of all that the Old Testament had pointed towards, the very promised leader that Moses had said would come in Deuteronomy 18. Christ has said, I am the one that Moses wrote about. I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament. If you believed in the Old Testament, you would believe in me too. High expectations. People are being healed. People are being released from oppression. And I have to say that um, as we read through the synoptics, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and we come to this, uh, this feeding of the 5,000, Jesus' disciples had also been involved in public ministry. Jesus had sent them out in, in pairs, and they had healed the sick. They had released those who were possessed by demons. They had seen the power of Christ go through them and touch others. And when they returned, they were excited, and they told the Lord, you know, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And they had experienced the power of God's grace in Christ through them. And so what a tremendous time here in the life of Israel as Christ, the word made flesh, is ministering in their midst. And so now he's looking for a break and he travels by boat to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee and the people come by tens of thousands around the northern shore and come down and, and meet him there. And then there's a day of ministry and at the end of the day, he turns to his disciples and he says to them, so it's time to give them something to eat. And Philip, just a very practical, sensible logistician, says, how? Eight months' wages wouldn't be able to provide a single person here with just one bite to eat. And then Andrew says, well, there's a little boy here and he's got five discount loaves of barley bread the stuff that Tina looks for when she goes to the grocery store on the clearance rack. So there's this, these five barley loaves of bread and a couple of fishes, and then Jesus has them sit down. And he gives thanks to God as he breaks the bread, and then everyone has enough and is satisfied. And there's 12, there's a dozen bushels of bread left over. And they're just, you know, what's, what's happening here? This must be the king, and so let's put him in power. And they want to make Jesus king by force, John tells us. And then Jesus just, he just disappears. He does not, uh, he's not interested in the temporal power that they have in mind. He's really not interested in uh, taking Caesar's authority by force, and he just disappears. These are unusual days with the word of God made flesh ministering. He is the bread of life. And next week, we're going to take a look at the marvelous discourse that unpacks this miracle in the verse 15 verses of chapter 6. And now Jesus has sent, the, Mark tells us, he sends the disciples back across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and it's dark, it's night. And so here we pick up our text this morning. This is the word of the Lord. John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake 
where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Let us pray. Almighty God, I ask that uh, in the next few minutes that you would uh, unpack uh, the power of the gospel revealed in and through uh, Christ our Lord as he walks uh, on the water in the midst uh, of a storm with the disciples straining at the oars. Almighty God, help us to understand what it is to, uh, to fear you and to uh, literally just to invite you into the boat. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So what is the position of the disciples here? Well, we've already talked about the fact that they've experienced the power of God through their own public ministry. They've just seen this remarkable miracle of Christ feeding probably 20,000 people. And uh, it's interesting, Mark, in Mark chapter 6, there they are. He says that uh, their hearts are hardened because they did not understand. Even though they had experienced Christ and they had experienced the power of Christ's ministry through them, their hearts are still darkened, hardened. They don't have a right understanding of Jesus. And so John says, here they are, evening has come, the disciples go down to the lake and they get off into the boat and they set out for Capernaum. But now it was dark. And so this canvas of creation, the Lord orchestrates for communicating truth. So here is a setting, and it's not just a literary device. It's the God of creation, using creation to sort of set the environment and the setting. Physically, it is dark. Mark, or Luke, I can't recall right now, says it was the fourth watch of the night. It's like between three in the morning and six in the morning. Maybe it's four in the morning. It's the time uh, in the, uh, the middle of the morning that I never want to get up, but I find myself frequently getting up. So there it is. It's dark. And uh, they are not with Jesus. This is a little like Nicodemus, John tells us in verse 2 of chapter 3, coming to Jesus in the evening, in the darkness. And, it, and you know, it's, it's fascinating that uh, they're in a place where Jesus had commanded them to be, according to Mark in verse, chapter 6, verse 45. He sent them out into that sea, that dark sea, without him. He is establishing conditions for another opportunity to reveal himself to them and to them alone in a way that they would not have known otherwise. And the disciples are about to experience yet another test of their faith, their trust in Jesus. It's fascinating. As we continue through chapter 6, many of Christ's disciples will simply turn from him in another day or so. And so they are. There they are. They're in the darkness, in the middle of the sea, verse 18. Now, in the Old Testament, we see the sea representing a chaos and disorder. In Job chapter 38, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst, for, burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. The sea represents this need for restraint that God himself provides. In Psalm 29, a psalm of David, ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. For the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice, the voice of the Lord is majestic. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits. He sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with 
peace. Psalm 65, Lord, you answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness. O God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. Psalm 89.9, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. I was talking to Steve Christian, Christensen uh, uh, during uh, fellowship time, and uh, he served on an aircraft carrier back in the day. And he said that aircraft carrier is 60 feet, the deck, 60 feet above the ocean. And he says there are times when he's been out to sea, and maybe many of you can, can appreciate this. I've been on an aircraft carrier, but it was docked, right? It was docked in San Diego, it was docked in Hawaii. It's pretty impressive. But I could not imagine, and it, it looks like, I mean, it's a marvelous feat of engineering with 5,000 souls or more running around that thing. But could you imagine being out there in the middle of the sea and having the sea, you know, coming over top of the deck of an aircraft carrier? Just the power of the sea. So I've been fishing off the North Shore of Oahu, a little fishing boat, which was pretty cool. It was a very calm day, and I was out there with a few infantrymen. And the, the swells were six, seven, maybe eight feet, and we're going up and down, up and down, and it didn't matter how many, you know, uh, tuna we were catching. The infantry men were not that comfortable. They were a little disturbed at the power of the sea. And yet, uh, brothers and sisters, God is the Lord of creation, and here in uh, just a few Old Testament texts, we see his sovereignty over the sea. And it's going to be presented, right, as Christ is walking over the waters of the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a storm where the disciples are in the dark and the waters are raging. They're straining at the oars. It's the middle of the night. And just like the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the chaos of the waters in creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, Jesus is moving across the waters and he's moving straight to his disciples who are in a battle, right? Maybe they're at ease. Maybe they realize they're in deep water. There's another event that Luke tells us, I think, in chapter 8 of the Gospel of Luke. They're, in, they're on the sea, and it's not comfortable. It's beyond their comfort limit as experienced fishermen. And they think they're going to drown. And Jesus is asleep, right, on the boat. And they tap him on the shoulder and say, Lord, like, don't you care? We are about to drown right here. <laughs> Jesus wakes up, and he says, oh, you have little faith. And he rebukes the sea and the winds, and then it's glass. And then what's the response of the disciples? Then it gets really scary, right? <laughs> now, this is, this is something that is beyond, you know, their ability to understand. The glory and the power of Christ, who is the Word made flesh. John tells us at the beginning of this gospel, right? All things were created by him. He is the king of creation. So back to, this, uh, to the sea. It's interesting, in Revelation 13, 1, where does the beast come from? The beast comes out of the sea. Isaiah 57, the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, with the wicked. So the sea re represents this place of chaos and disorder, and yet the Lord is Lord of it. It also represents a barrier that needs to be passed through. And as we see that, right, in Exodus 14, and I'm not going to take the time to turn to it, but as, he, as Moses is leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, they come to this physical barrier called the Red Sea. Nowhere to go. Pharaoh decides, because the Lord has hardened his heart, to chase after them and said, what was I thinking in letting this, you know, this, this nation of Israel go, so let me go and get them back. And so he, he, he mounts up with his army, and he, he tracks down the people of Israel. And what's the lament of the people of Israel in, in verse 10? Same word in the Septuagint as what we have here in our text today, phobeo. They are terrified because they've got this world power tracking them down, and they have nowhere to go. And so the glory of God and the, that glory cloud and the pillar of fire move behind the people of Israel and creates this buffer zone between Pharaoh and his army 
and the people of Israel who are afraid. You know, they had lamented, why did you bring us out here, Moses, you know, to, to die here at the edge of the Red Sea? They're afraid. And then Moses gives them great comfort, you know, do not be afraid. And then see the salvation of God, and the Lord commands Moses to speak, and the waters separate. So on the left and on the right, you've got this wall of sea, which represents judgment. And they pass through this judgment on the dry ground, and Moses, as the good shepherd, leads them through on the dry ground. And then what happens with, and then the glory of God lifts, and then Pharaoh and his army pursue, and the waters of judgment fall upon Pharaoh and his army. So the sea is a means of judgment. And there the disciples are. They're on the sea. It's, it's dark. It's raging. They're straining at the oars, and the winds are against them. The boat is being buffeted by the waves because the wind is against it, Matthew tells us in Matthew 14. And then they see something they do not expect. They see Jesus approaching, and they are terrified. Phobeo is the word, terribly, terribly frightened. So in verses 19 through 20, the approach of Jesus as he walks on the water, and then what is Christ's response to his disciples who are in this? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been afraid? I mean, just, you know, your knees are shaking, afraid. A few times in my life I can say, I have really been afraid. And uh, one of the times that just I always go back to, it's kind of silly, but there I was, it was Christmas morning, and I was trying to sneak out my normal, my normal SOP and check out what was under the Christmas tree before everyone got up. And uh, lo and behold, there was a shadow cast across my bedroom door, and I swore it was the shadow of Frankenstein. And I was petrified. I could not move. <laughs> and so there I stayed in my bed, didn't get out to the Christmas tree until it was safe to do so. But can you relate? Have you ever been there? Petrified, terrified. You know, in my little pastor's note this week, I wrote, you know, many times I have uh, been in a position to pray when a mentor of mine taught me as the cardinal rule. Always relax to the point of self-control. Many, many times I've asked the Lord, Lord, give me your peace and enable me to relax to the point of self-control, just a simple gift of the Holy Spirit when we're in situations that are a threat to the breath of life to ourselves or to others. Or when our loved ones are in a, in a place where you know, we are afraid for them. So we all have different kinds of boats that the Lord sends us out to, right? We're all straining at the oars in a lot of different ways. And Jesus approaches, and here he approaches the disciples, and he gives this first glimmer, right, of the divine name. You know, it is I. I am. Through the Gospel of John, this, uh, this declaration will become consistent, consistently unpacked. Right? You know, as this is the one that John the Baptist t tells us in chapter 1. This is the pre-existent one. For after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Later on in chapter 6, Jesus is going to declare, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Next week. Chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Chapter 10, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus says to to us in John 11:25, "I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live, even though he dies." Chapter 14: "I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me." Chapter 15: "I am the true vine." My father is the gardener. Chapter 18, when they come to arrest him, he simply says, I am he. And those who would be his captors fall back to the ground. 
the simple declaration of his name, I am he. He declares the name of the divine one. And then he says this, don't be afraid. Deuteronomy 20, he shall say, Hear, O Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory. Moses again in Exodus 14, 13, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never, you will never see again, for the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Jesus says in Matthew 10, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The transfiguration in Matthew 17, after uh, the father declares, this is my son in whom I delight, and the glory of Christ is revealed, the disciple Peter, James, and John, it's interesting, John doesn't write about this in the gospel. You know, they fall down and they are terrified. And what does Jesus say to them? It's the same admonition here, don't be afraid. Or how about the, uh, the good shepherd, the shepherds? At the announcement of Christ's birth, encountering the angelic hosts, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Or the resurrected Christ at his tomb, dealing with Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. When they encounter him, he says, do not be afraid, but go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. All of this is powerful fulfillment of promise in Isaiah 35. I won't take the time to read it all. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way, O Lord. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear, for your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. So what is the result of uh, responding to Christ when he says, uh, do not be afraid? Well, the disciples invite him into the boat. Pretty amazing. They receive Jesus into the boat, the Lord of glory. And it's quite remarkable. They immediately get to the other side, John tells us. They get to where they were heading. What an act of grace. And so for just a few minutes here this morning, I just want to think a little bit about what it is to, uh, to fear the Lord. What does uh, right fear look like? What does uh, maybe a wrong fear, a misunderstood response to Jesus look like? And then what does not fearing him at all look like? So, I think we see uh, a, mis a fear of Jesus that's based on not rightly understanding the one they're encountering. And I think we see this with the, the religious leaders, with the Pharisees. I think we see it with Pilate. There is, we don't, they don't quite get the authority of Jesus, but they do know that he is a threat to their power. I mean, Herod didn't quite understand the Messiah, and so he had all of these two-year-olds killed trying to secure his temporal power, a misunderstanding of the very nature of Christ. Pilate, when he's, as we, come, as we come to John chapter 19, John tells us he's afraid. He doesn't know who he's dealing with. But it doesn't mean he has a right understanding or saving faith. And the disciples here, even here, they don't quite comprehend the truth of Christ, this God-man, the Word made flesh. So there's an uncertainty. And I think maybe for some of us as Christians, we are afraid of Christ because we don't want to give up control. We don't want him, you know, uh, coming in and guiding us in our affections, in our time, and in our finances. And so this makes us uncomfortable. Maybe there's, we could talk about, well, I, I fear Jesus when I'm afraid that, you know, if, I, if he is my Lord, it's going to radically change my life. And then there's this uh, 
there are those who do not fear the Lord. And uh, I want to just spend a little bit of time in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and just ask the question, well, what does it look like, you know, not to fear the Lord? How do we, maybe we can learn a little something about fearing the Lord by thinking a little bit about not fearing the Lord. And in 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, that's first. There is a, uh, those who dear, do not fear the Lord, Paul tells us, will perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. That there is a powerful delusion upon those who do not fear the Lord. They believe the lie. They do not believe the truth. And they delight in wickedness. So not fearing the Lord is not loving the truth. It is perishing because they do not love the truth. There's a condemnation for those who do not believe the truth, but rather delight in wickedness. In chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, just going back a couple of pages, verses uh, well, chapter 3, Oh, it's second, second Timothy. Okay, so pain medication wearing off. <laughs> and I can't read my own handwriting, so that's a problem. Second, second Timothy chapter 3. Here we go. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Those who do not fear the Lord are lovers of themselves. They are lovers of money. They are boastful, proud. They are abusive disobedient to their parents, they are ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. Those who do not fear God are brutal. They are not lovers of the good. They are treacherous, rash, conceited. They are lovers of pleasure. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. Those who know nothing of the fear of God Do not put up with sound doctrine in chapter 4. They turn away from the truth and they turn to myths. A few verses before in chapter 3. They are loaded down with sins, those who do not fear the Lord. They are swayed by their evil desires. In verse 7 of chapter 3, they are always learning, always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. Those who do not fear the Lord oppose truth. They are, Paul says, people of a depraved mind. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul uh, admonishes, admonishes us to live to please God. And those who do not fear the Lord, they do not avoid sexual immorality. They do not love their brothers and sisters, and they do not live a quiet life. They are not hardworking, and they are dependent on others. The opposite of fearing the Lord. And in Daniel chapter 5, the Lord took me to this this week, we see Belshazzar, and he has taken the sacred objects that they had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And he is partying with these holy objects with his friends and his concubines. And then God's judgment uh, arrives on Belshazzar in verse 5 of chapter 5. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. And the king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. Brothers and sisters, I think 
each and every human being will encounter the glory of God and will ultimately fall on their knees. Their knees will give way and they will be afraid. We will all be fearful when we encounter him in his glory. But for some, like Belshazzar here, it will be too late. Daniel comes and he interprets this sign that, uh, that God gives to Belshazzar and he contrasts his father Nebuchadnezzar's humility and giving honor and glory to God with uh, Belshazzar's pride and then he interprets the words mene mene tekel parsin God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end you have been weighed on the scales and you've been found wanting your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians per Persians and that very night Belshazzar king of the Babylonians was slain judgment came right then and there it wasn't sufficient that his knees were sh shaking because he had encountered the judgment of God. It was too late for Belshazzar. Brothers and sisters, the power of the gospel is remarkable. In 1 John chapter 4, you know, Paul, John tells us that God's love washes away our fear, but we must first fear the Lord before we know what it is to have his fear washed away, to encounter him in his holiness and us in our creatureliness. We've got to be like the disciples, straining at the oars, surrounded by the sea, and then just wrestling and then encountering Christ in his glory. And we need to respond rightly to us when he says, it is I. Do not be afraid. We need to be able to like the disciples. We need to be able to invite him in. And then he'll get us to where we need to go. And all of us are kind of straining at the oars in different ways. But Christ is the same today as he was yesterday. And you know what? The Apostle John would encounter the glory of God in Christ on multiple occasions. And he would always be terrified. But he would always cling to the love of God. And Christ would always be his good shepherd. And the old man on the island of Patmos would fall as though his feet, at the feet of Christ, as though he were dead. In Revelation chapter 1, and what's the words of the good shepherd to his servant John at the end of his life? Don't be afraid. It is I. But unless you are secured in the knowledge of the love of Christ for you, your knees are going to shake. And there's going to be no hope on that final day. Mary says in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, Hey, Mary, you found favor in the sight of God. And she's afraid. She says, Don't be afraid. You found favor in the sight of God. And then in her song, I think in verse 50, she gives thanks to God. And she declares... His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, brothers and sisters, it is my hope that the mercy of God would extend to us so that we might fear him, and that we might grow in holiness, and that we would know the power of his love for us. Let us love one another, brothers and sisters, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us to, uh, to know what it is to fear you rightly, uh, to turn from uh, our own wickedness, to turn from suppressing the truth, from straining at the oars in our own strength. There we are in the midst of the dark and turbulent sea, and it is raging. And our own pride will keep us straining at the oars, but I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you come. You declare your divine name. You command us not to be afraid. 
And some, like Peter, you even invite to come and join on the water. Lord, give us faith to trust you, to keep our eyes fixed on you, that you might take us uh, to that ultimate destination, which is on the other side of the sea and in uh, heaven, glory with you face to face. Help us to understand eternal life today through your love. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Fakney. He may have run out of medication, but he didn't run out of juice. So that's good news. And we will now, um, if you are able, rise. We're going to sing our hymn of response, which is faith of our fathers. We leave this building um, walking in that faith, walking in the true fear of the Lord. Faith of our fathers. We'll sing the first and the third uh, verses. Hymn number 404. Please receive this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>